one. This roll of lights could go. Yes. Just um, high maintenance already. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to see if we could knock the lights down a little bit because my preference is always black slides, and sometimes that can be a, a little bit difficult to, to read when there's lights on. Okay, yeah, that's great, thanks. So, um, obviously I'm here to focus on elite performance today and answer your questions after the presentation. I do this with two different hats on. Uh, I was an ex-elite performer from a previous generation, so I'll chat a little bit about that, but I'll also chat about our programme now, being head coach of the national team, and with regards to players coming through, what we're looking for, okay, and how are we trying to develop elite performers of the future. So, two different hats on when, when I go through this. What I would say, and I'm going to go straight into this from the off, there's three key areas for me. When you talk about elite performance, three key words that sum up everything that needs to happen. Okay, and they start with these letters. First one being discipline, second one being practice, hard work, and the third one being love. Okay, they're three key areas for me if you want to work in an elite performance environment or if you want to be an elite performance performer. If you don't have these, you're probably not going to get there. Okay, you have to be disciplined to do the amount of practice you're going to end up having to do if you want to be a top level performer. And if you don't love what you do, you're never going to do, you're never going to do those hours. Okay, so that's the reality of the roles we have and our environment. So, a little bit about me, so you understand kind of where I come from and my thoughts on things. Educationally, all these places have affected me. Okay, so when I say education, I don't mean the institutes I've been in with regards to schooling necessarily, but the club environments, okay, the different sporting environments I've been lucky en enough to be a part of. So, to sum it all up, I have a varied background, okay, I was a GB athlete as a youngster, and that only came around because there wasn't women's football. I played football for the boys clubs up till 12, then I was told because I was a female, and no other reason, because I was a female, I couldn't play anymore. Okay, what am I going to do? I'm a kid who loves burning energy off, I love sport, the only other option for me at the time a decent uh, PE teacher and she put me into athletics and things went on and I, I enjoyed that part of my life but it wasn't actually what I wanted. Football obviously, luckily enough to be captain of the national team and uh, be involved for many years there. Obviously from a, how many years was I playing? 18 years, 61 caps, isn't actually that much? But maybe you want to ask Helen about questions about that and how the infrastructure, how everything in the FAW has changed over time. You know, these day, this day and age, if I have a player who's playing for that length of time, there's probably going to be 200 caps up there. Reality. Thankfully, things have changed. Um, educationally, I'm actually a physio. I'm not charged with physio anymore because I don't practice, but I'm a physio. That's my qualification. It's one way I ended up at Arsenal at the time, and it was through the educational route that took me up to London in the first place and out the valleys. And obviously coaching, I stand here as a UEFA Pro License and um, obviously all those things underneath have come before that. So, employment-wise, so a massive part of my life was spent at this club, all right? At the time, best club in the world for female football, okay? Fact. I wasn't a full-time player, so people may assume I was an ex-pro, I wasn't. We didn't have that luxury to say, but we did get jobs in the club. So were they full-time jobs that asked 40 hours of us? No, but we had an impact on the future generations with the roles we had there. Okay, and these are the roles I fulfilled. My main role was medical officer at the club because of my physio background. When I finished playing, I had a great opportunity to go and join Reading Football Club. And I was first team manager and director of the programme there for the girls. And um, enjoyed my time there immensely, but it was my first jump into management. So, whole different ball game. All right, learned so much in that environment. Really thankful for the opportunity. Uh, didn't spend too long there because obviously the FAW then gave me the opportunity to come and look after our women's programme. My original role here was the under-15s team manager, working with the babies, which I loved immensely. Um, don't do that anymore. Obviously, I look after the 17s, 19s and the senior programme. The performance programme that we run is actually based here right now. Hopefully, we're going to take that into other areas of Wales in the future. But thankfully, obviously, we've partnered up with this institute and it's been a fantastic development tool for us. Done a bit of work for UEFA ambassadorial work, especially with the Champions League. Obviously, that was a great event a few years ago in Cardiff for us. Um, and I do do some commentary on BBC Sport, or basically around the women's game. My interest is in the women's game, okay? People will always throw things at you. Do you want to work in the men's game? Why? I've got everything I need here. I'm a coach. I want to develop people. 
this environment is far more interesting to me because there's so much growth to still to happen. Okay, playing career. As I said, went up to uh, Arsenal, uh, I believe I was 20 at the time, so quite late. Some of you might think it was earlier. These are the things I managed to accumulate. Okay, and I'm very proud of them. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but I am very proud of them. But it's just a highlight of that generation. We were the best that were around. And that wasn't just in the UK. It wasn't just in Europe. It was probably in the world. Okay, there were some US teams at the time would probably question that. But I'd stand here and i go, no, we were the best. All right, and I enjoyed, I enjoyed every minute of that environment. Learned so much, made some great friends. Um, but the main things I learned that now help me in the roles I do now are these things, okay? That club at the time was the only female club in the UK that allowed the female game to grow so quickly because we were part of the club. We weren't the women's team, we were part of Arsenal, okay? From a physio point of view, I did my CPD days, I did my development days with the men's first team physio, okay? There wasn't an issue there between gender. We were involved in all the things we needed to be involved in because of who we were, not because we were females or we weren't men, we were involved in everything we needed to be in, okay? So alongside all that that was given to us was world-class expectations. We were expected to win things. There was lots of pressure in ways. As players, we didn't feel it. We just wanted to win everything we did, okay? And when you're in an, env in an environment like that, it changes you as a person. There's expectations on you from the outside, but that will never be as big as the expectations from inside, okay, reality. Obviously, being at the Arsenal Football Club, we had a style of play. We had an ethos that we had to stick to. It was a team ethic. Always was, always will be. We had to learn how to compete. Because every single season, whether it was the start of the season or mid-season, we'd have world-class players coming in. As individuals, we had to know how to deal with that. And we had to compete. Every single training session, you had to be the best you could be. Because if you weren't, you ain't going to play. Reality. Biggest thing for me, influence is that I thankfully had there were the people that I worked with or worked under, worked alongside with. And they vary. Now, some of you in the room may know who this guy is if you're a big football fan. Okay? Arsenal, uh, Arsenal was obviously managed for a heck of a long time by Arsene Wenger. And now, you might sit in the room if your Arsenal fans have different thoughts on that. Obviously, it didn't end in the way that he would have liked. But Borough was his number two. But as a guy who I would pretty much daily when I was doing my um, A license speak to, okay? Number two, Arsene Wenger. Could go and have a conversation with him whenever I wanted. Okay, so I learned a lot. Terry Burton's another one. Again, those of you more in involved in football will understand this guy, the experience, the level of this guy, okay? The technical directors. He's been in different football clubs. I actually don't know where he's finished up, up but one of the best coaches around. Obviously, they were all direct in the men's program at the, club, at the club at the time. Neil Banfield's another one. Ended up being a uh, main coach with the first team with Arsene Wenger. When I joined the club, he was the youth team coach. So he's a guy who came and took our sessions a lot. And when he was in those sessions, and when he was delivering those sessions, I used to stand there in awe. Because me as a player, that was the best I ever played. Okay, so me as the wanting to be coach, I used to love it because I wanted to be him. The way he motivated players, the standards that he set for those players taught me a heck of a lot. Okay, and hopefully he's teaching my players the same right now. Marcus Svensson, conditioning coach, okay, worked at the top level of the men's game. And then Emma Hayes, there's not many females on there because at the time there weren't many around who were doing the roles that I was actually interested in. But Emma Hayes is obviously Chelsea manager, lots of experience in different areas of the world with regards to the women's game, top level coach, okay. So sum it all up. I was taught professionalism and how to be the best at all times, okay? And that's something that is hopefully coming into the women's program in Wales. It's a big part of what we do. So how did I get in the first place? Okay, I'm gonna go into depth of my route, my journey between 12 years of age and older. But this takes me into our current program. I got there because of these. Now you can't actually see that very well, which is a pity because these slides that I'm actually using now, I flipped the slides, these are our women's program slides. So any women's national team that's happening, if we're delivering any presentation, these are our slides. These are our value system, okay? Yes, this is about me as an individual, but our players aren't, no, aren't any different. I'll flip to this, because you may be able to see it or you may not. Is there any way we can 
shut them. Because this is a big part of what I want to speak about, if we can. Is it becoming any clearer? Okay, that's what they are. Okay, and they, they, they could just be words, they're not words. All right, anybody in our program has to understand what they mean to each and every one of us. They have to live them when they're on camp. Hopefully, they live them when they're off camp, but definitely when they're on camp, they have to show it. They have to enjoy doing these things. Okay, it's quite obvious when a player is fighting against this and doesn't want to buy into this value system. It's really obvious to those players they're trying to play alongside and definitely to the coaching group around them. And the last bit is a lifestyle. Okay, it's a lifestyle. If you want to be an elite performer, you're choosing the lifestyle. You're not choosing a hobby. You're not choosing something you do in your part-time, okay, or your, your time off from school or work. It's a lifestyle. That's why not many people do it, okay? Not what the percentage of people who do top-level sport is in the world, but there's not many people that do it. So, a little bit more info for you. So, I'll go a bit on to now what the Welsh programme is about. What are we doing? Why are we running here? Who, the, who are the people that we're trying to develop? So, from a technical basis, player profile looks like this. Not necessarily in order, okay? But we do expect all our players to have this in abundance. And it's because of the top level of the game. If they don't have the first bit, they're not going to be a national team player. Reality. It's not because I want to play quick football, it's because top level of the women's game is quick. You have to be athletic. Okay, if you don't that, have that, unfortunately, you're probably not going to be in the, in the senior team in the future. But the next two I put up are probably the most important things. Because if you aren't this, you're, you're, you're pointless to us. If you don't want to win everything you do, you don't want to be the best, look, reality check, you can never be the best at everything, but if you don't want to be the best, you shouldn't be in top level sport. You'll get found out, okay? The last bit is a massive one for me as an individual. I want people around me who have that. Because top level sport, we're gonna have lots of adversity to try and deal with, okay? Lots at times, whether it's injury, whether it's we're one nil down in a game, or we're three nil down, whatever it is, how do we respond? We just go, ref, blow the whistle, we're done. We're not gonna come back, okay? If you, if you struggle with this, again, I don't want you on the pitch. We're a small nation. We're not gonna walk on the pitch and go five nil up against the US straight away. It's not gonna happen. Could go the other way. How do we respond? Do we give up? Okay, these for me are key things for our players. And generally ne necessarily our players, our staff as well. So, national team players, what do they need to have? I'm not gonna talk to you now about, can they receive the ball well? Can they take people on in a 1v1? Can they finish? Are they good strikers? That's not, that's not uh, what this is about today. I want you to try and understand who the people are who are in our environment. There's one sitting over there, okay? And you, and you can chat to her in a bit. The people who are in our environment are these people. This is who they are, okay? They are people who generally focus on at positive attributes, but themselves as well as others, all right? Which, as females, that can be quite tough at times because we are always questioning ourselves and our ability, always, okay? It's probably a general consensus of all females in the room. You doubt yourselves way too much. We try and flip it, okay, as often as we can in our environment. You have to have an ability to perform under pressure. It's only really tested when you are in those key situations, okay? You have to work hard enough so you get chosen to actually get the opportunity to prove you can do this. You have to be intelligent. There are many players playing the game that aren't picked for national teams, not just in Wales, not just in female football, in all football. And it's the difference between probably club football, especially lower level club football and national team. You have to be intelligent. Every single player that steps on the pitch for the national team has a job to do. If you don't understand that job, again, you shouldn't be on the pitch. They are intelligent. They might not come over as that straight away. But when it comes to football, they are intelligent. And we test them in lots of ways to check that. They're receptive, okay? They want to learn. They enjoy learning. Physical excellence, massive part of the program from minute one when I came in, and it is to do with analyzing the top level of <coughs> the women's game. That's where we're trying to go. So we have to be able to compete, okay? And I've just written afterwards, it's due to, it's, 
It's not necessarily so they can run out, outrun opponents or keep up with opponents. It's so that in the 89th minute, they still know their roles. So if you're physically better conditioned, your brain is going to work far better when you're tired. So that's a massive part of, of what we do. Next bit, humility. So under, accept differences between each other. The, a big part of our program is I don't want clones there. I don't want people who come in and act like everybody else. I want our personalities to come out. Mine, because I'm a little bit mad, has to come out. Our players are similar. They they're all different. Okay? There are lines that we can't cross to make sure we do these things well. But I do want personalities to come out, come out from everybody. So that means we have to, have to accept differences, because we are different. Last bit, respect. Probably overruns all the others. Respect. Okay, because for our players to have the belief in themselves, they have to feel respected by others. If they don't get that, they're never going to believe in themselves. They're never going to want to believe in anybody else on the pitch with them or in our environment. Okay, so this, this for me is, this is a profile of a player, a person. Okay, this is what we're trying to develop. Are we there yet? 100% no. We look at this, I look at this program, and in 20 years' time, it'll be the program I want. Whether I'm allowed to, to continue the role for that long, that's probably unrealistic. But reality is, that's, that's where we are. Okay, it's very early days. But if we do get there, we are going to be this, and we are going to be in top final tournaments in the future regularly. Right now, we're working towards it. Okay, this is where we're trying to get to. So, if you're in our environment right now, you are going to be completely invested in this program. Okay? It's going to run your life. You're going to have a fantastic work ethic. This is a national team program. Okay? The people who are in it are at the top level. Okay? Players, coaches, they're people who want to develop. They are going to set high standards, but they have to demand them as well, of themselves. This is not about demanding from, each from others, it's about demanding it from yourself, keeping your own standards high. They are ambitious people, and they're al also confident. Confident, not arrogant. Confidence, for me, this is a personal thing, you see people who understand their strengths, but then you also see within that person, they can acknowledge their weakness, and they're prepared to work on it. Okay? That's what, what we expect from all of us in our environment. Next two ones are a bit uh, even more important, I guess. Enthusiastic, and this is a personal thing for me. Your, what I'd love is that in our environment is every single player can show this enthusiasm whenever they're with us. But due to lack of confidence at times, lack of belief, they don't. You see it in glimpses. The senior squad, 17 squad, 19 squad. But again, we're working towards this being a massive part of what we do. People in the environment enjoying the environment. Okay, and showing that energy within it. And the last bit, this is the most important, it overruns everything for me. Trustworthy people. People who actually respect you enough. To, you can trust them with information. You can trust them with the deepest of your thoughts at times. Okay? For us as a female group, this isn't about men, male football. Because if the men, men's manager Ryan was you, he'd tell you something completely different. As a group of females, I believe I'm sure if you questioned all our players, they'd say the same thing. They want to be able to trust everyone, okay? Then they'll work for each other. As females, we want success as a collective. It's not about us as an individual. There are a couple, don't get me wrong, there's the, 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 the odd different player that is about themselves and always will be as a female. They're a top level player and there's th they've got there for reasons. For us, as a small nation, okay? with players who actually 50% are playing top level, 50% aren't. We have to have a group ethic, a team ethic, that overruns everything else. Okay, if we don't have this, that's a problem. So, FAW, standing now with my FAW hat on, being an employee of the FAW, this is how I see our targets. Now, there are FAW staff in the room that might have been told something different. I'm not trying to contradict anyone. But as national team manager, this is how we see it. This is our role. Okay, we have to educate people on women's football, women's football, women's sport. How do we develop young females? What's the difference? Is our, have we got a gen, gen, generic, bog-standard development program for a footballer? If we have, it's wrong. Okay, we have to start changing our thought process. We have to start educating all, co all coaches who come through our education program. Okay, 
anybody that we impact, we have to start educating them in those ways. We are females, we are different in lots of different ways. There's top level research out there to prove it. Okay, but we still have to fight. Helen, myself, the coaches who work with me, we still have to fight to get that through to people. Okay, so this is a massive part of what we're doing right now. We have to profile our players better. We have some people in the room who are, have a massive job to play with regards to that. And I'm looking forward to that developing over the future because we have some fantastic individuals in our environment. I've just gone through what they look like. I want people knowing who they are. And I want us as a nation to be proud of them. So sum it all up, we have to inspire people, okay? Me and my coaches, we have to inspire players to develop. Our players have to inspire the nation to want to love women's football because it's still a massive part of the population that wouldn't even turn it on, okay? They'll, have an, uh, they'll judge us, they'll assume certain things without they even looking at the game, any game. So we have to change those thought processes. So we have a massive job, okay? One that actually I'm really enjoying doing. But for me, elite performance, sum it all up again, key areas. If you're a player in the room, get this through, okay? Get this in your head. You ain't gonna get there unless you have this bit, okay? Coaches who wanna coach at the top level, work at the top level, it's no different. Anybody from the journalists in the room, they wanna be top level journalist, okay? This, this overrides lots of things. I focus on elite performance in sport with it, but if you wanna be the top level of anything, you need this stuff. Okay, last bit from me. Just, and I do hope this works. New laptop and all, which means it might not. Mm. This was a highlight. We drew against England. We didn't win the World Cup. We had a point. Personality, belief coming out? I hope so. That's why I put it there. Okay. Thanks for listening. Thank you guys for Jane for presenting her findings now. Um, uh, we'll be presenting questions to Jane, so uh, I'll kick off. Having found um, your career in terms of playing for Arsenal um, and speaking about your inspirations, do you think that because of your success with Wales and the performance plan that you're putting in place, perhaps now you're a trailblazer for Welsh football coaches to get involved in coaching? Look, I, I stand here um, and I, uh, my joy of the role I do is it is about developing people. You know, any coach who works in any capacity, you know, the word coach to me means you're there to develop others, you're there to facilitate their learning. So um, for me, that's, that's how I see myself. And uh, hopefully we will have a, a positive impact on not just players, uh, not just coaches, but actually female sport as a whole in Wales. Um, you speak as well about unison and how love and everything. I think that was a massive part in just in terms of what you do over the last World Cup qualifying campaign. Yeah, well, you break it down, look, and I can only talk about myself. So again, Helen's in the room, so she might, might say similar or different. Uh, that love of what you do, gets you to the top level. You know, I, I, when I was a kid, we didn't have organized training sessions. I'd be running around blind on the field with my dog in the rain on a Saturday afternoon because actually that was the reality of what I had. I didn't have organized training sessions to make myself better. I ran up the Rickos Mountain. I'm a psycho, okay? But I wanted to get somewhere. And if you want to get somewhere, you have to do strange things at times. Um, yeah, that, that, but the reason I was happy to do it, I, you know, there was a smile on my face doing these things is because I loved what I did. You know, I love the game, I love football. Football, I read a quote the other day and some, somebody said, football isn't about gender uh, or anything. It's, it's football. Anybody can be involved in football. You know, it's not necessarily about ability levels at times. We work in the capacity that is the elite level. But football should be loved by all, and different types of people with different skill sets. Thank you, Jane. So um, would anyone like to ask any questions? Volunteering for Italy, um, just 
and last year we had I think 20 girls play football in, in the town. We're now up to about 200. Now part of the reason is obviously your work up to set, but we found a catalyst to it, setting up girls only teams. And I want to know either Helen or yourself opinion on how we develop girls, both for elite performance and maybe for lifelong participation. Yeah, look, I, I think the ideal for us as a nation is we provide different types of opportunities for those different personalities that are out there. There will be some players who would prefer to play with boys um, because the tempo is quicker, etc. There are so many young females who are very different to that and they want to feel comfortable in the environment. So they do want to train alongside girls and learn alongside girls. So for us, the challenge is, is to make sure we provide a varied development programme for our young players. Um, it, it's a realm that I'm not too involved in right now, if I'm honest. Um, I'd like to be in the future, but um, don't know enough details about the programme to run right now. Anyone else? Helen? Um, yeah, Shane, sure. just on the, the coverage which we got from the seeds throughout the World Cup qualifying campaign, do you think that's now set down a marker which you hope will continue into the, into the Euro qualifying campaign? Do you know, I look at that very similarly to I look at our national senior team right now. It's the start point of something. There's so much work still to do. It could be better. That's not me criticising anyone, by the way. That's me going, actually, we've started something, but there's so much growth to happen. If people assume it should just be the level that we had, then we, we need to change that thought process because it needs to grow and grow and grow. You know, every morning, one of my routines is, as I have my breakfast, I look on BBC Sport. I don't know how many mornings there are where I go all the way through it, where there is the homepage, the Welsh page, nothing about female sport are we really that boring or disinterested to people that people don't really want to know how people do it you're telling me we don't have welsh sports people who are doing good things right now i don't know enough about it right but i'm sure there are in different sports not just football it'd be great if there's lots of football but so look i i challenge people on their thoughts with regards to that um obviously the if you, if you look at our association or if you look bigger picture, BBC, for example, the people you have to start changing the thought process of are the people at the top. Um, there's lots of different ways to do that, I guess. For us, our main role and our way to do that is get, result, get results at the top level. And then people want to listen to us more. So we've got to keep doing it. Do perhaps the media uh, probably have an influence then in terms of getting people into your performance? Yes, and huge, and massive, <laughs> massive. I'm not a Twitter person, as everybody knows. Um, I'm not a social media person, but we have some great people looking after that for us, and I think it's a great tool. It's you know one tool for us. But I think, look, I, the more profiles of people involved in female sport that can be out there for others to see, the better. This bit about people, oh, we won't put it out there because people aren't interested. I can't swear there's youngsters in the room. What a load of tosh. Put it out there and try. See how many people read it. Okay, it's always the, it's always the, no, oh no, people aren't interested. Whoa, 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 break it down. You're not interested. Have you done a consensus of everybody in the nation? They're really not interested. So yes, I'm very opinionated on this stuff because it needs to change. Do you think your profile perhaps has grown though in terms of, um, you speak about lack of coverage. Do you think um, because you've got a job now as a commentator as well, do you think um, that you're just making uh, careers for people? So perhaps even though you're, uh, a coach, you're also a commentator as well, so perhaps you're setting people to perhaps expose going for commentary as well. Yeah, look, for me, uh, it's a good learning tool for me. There's a selfish reason I do it, but there's it's also the giving back bit. It's about helping others learn. You know, um, there's most people who commentate are very good at it and probably a lot better than me, probably don't have the background of pro license coach. So when they're probably looking at the game differently, but then there's a percentage of people watching who would think like me or want to know more uh, from the coaching capacity. So I'm, I hope I'm, I'm helping with a bit more of a varied uh, discussion point when games are going on. Yeah, I, um, just from someone watching my experience as an audience football show and you've been on there, I've always thought you've been well-spoken. Thank you. you. I'm not sure about the attire <laughs> and the makeup. The makeup lady, I don't know who she thinks I am. I think she thinks <laughs> I'm 25, but um, no, thanks. That's OK. Uh, would anyone else uh, like to ask any questions as well towards Shane? Do 
you know, I, I wouldn't say it's advice as such. I'd ask you to help us. So I'd stand you and I go, you are the guys that need to help us. Because the, the, there were some high profile things that happened recently with regards to the Ballon d'Or and Hegeberg winning it. I think you all know the story I'm talking about. Best thing, I see it, and maybe it's the positive attitude bit, but I saw it as a great thing to happen because suddenly you've got really high profile male players having a voice and saying, that's not right. That's not good enough. That's better than anything that we could do as females ourselves. So we need men, we need you guys to help us change things. We need you to take an interest in it. We need you to do it as professionally as you can and make sure you help sell, us, sell the things that we are actually doing really well. Yeah, I'd just like to personally say as well, just, um, just being one of those 30 male students is that covering the women's campaign for us last year was such a valuable experience and um, it helped my journalism career, like just being able to have all the access because you and the players were always helpful with us and I'd like to thank you for your no participation as well. Thank you. Good to you. Thank you, Jane. Thanks.